Welcome to the Proclaim Podcast, where we sit down with missionary disciples and talk all things around sharing Jesus with others. Our hosts are Brett Powell, Heather Kim, Jason Jensen, Eric Chow, and Amber Zoll. Ideally, you know, if you can get to the point where, um, you know, you maybe you're reading scripture together, the gospels or something, you know, the story of Jesus, but you may just tell stories, you know, I, I develop, I, you know, simple versions of different gospel, important gospel stories that seem relevant to your friend's experience mm. and just, you know, say that, and just say, you know, this is, you know, it was really interesting. I was going through something similar and this story meant a lot to me. You know, mm. of what Je- or this, it, where Jesus said this, and it, it really helped me in that moment. That kind of thing you can say. Um, again, you're 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 gauging it based on your knowledge of your of your relationship. Yeah, um, yeah. That's interesting. How recognizing and like within the context of a relationship, we can bring in the, the gospel stories, uh, the teachings of Jesus, in a in a relational relevant way, which is different than teaching or catechetics or preaching or, you know, shoving it down someone's throat or whatever you want to call it. But um, that uh, that invites intentional disciples to be uh, living in a deeper way, uh, a Christ-centered life. Uh, that is, you know, that that means we are we are spending time in the scriptures, understanding and knowing the stories of Jesus, so that it relates to our lives. So it's it's not fabricated; it is real, and it's and it has in fact changed our lives in a in a small way or in a big way. So that's that's very very interesting um, that you bring it that up. And asking questions. Um, there's a wonderful book we actually sell. We we have it in our bookstore uh, called the Question Book. And basically, it's intended. It's they're gradated in terms of their, um, you know, the most general questions, right up to more, much more spiritually challenging personal questions. Um, but it, it's it's a wonderful resource to kind of think through um, possible questions that you know you could ask to to unearth their spiritual concerns and their spiritual and you know experiences. Um, you know, why is that important to you? It sounds like that's, you know, I mean, you've talked about this a lot. It sounds like it's really important to you. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I'm just wondering, you know, kind of what, what, what's been your experience or what happened, you know, so that the combination of really listening, of asking, showing real interest in, in, and especially, and, and through your questions, bringing out the spiritual implications, possible spiritual implications of the things they've been talking about. They may never have made the connection. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's a, so there's a whole variety of things that you can do. Um, you know, and there comes a point where you could say, you know, this is the whole, this is sort of, if you will, pre alpha, pre CCO. One of the things we're realizing and people are telling us around the world is we're now realizing something like Alpha or CCO, there are some presumptions there because originally they were created, well, they were created a while ago, you know, a, a couple of decades ago. I mean, Alpha's 30 years old and it was created for unchurched people in London, young adults, mm-hmm. which is great, except it did presume culture of some knowledge, some kind of an assumption that God exists, for instance, that you can't presume anymore. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people need pre-alpha, pre-CCO, pre, it's pre-evangelization. And that's what we're talking about here. The relationship, the building, the trust, the rousing, the curiosity, which is setting the stage for the point where you at some point would be able to say, you know, I'm part of this group that's meeting in my, I'm having it in my house, you know, and we're all kind of wrestling with a lot of the same questions. I'm wondering if you'd like to be part of it. Yeah. But yeah, let's well, dig into that, that pre-evangelization stage, stage, because I think that's, that's a you know that like you said it's it's becoming more and more of our reality and 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 being aware of that stage is 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 first step and then and then moving into knowing how and where we're we're in that because it seems as though that's 
um, you know, that's pre-program, that's pre pre-tool, it's 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 relationships, it's it's people. And I like when I think of that, that space, the hesitancy for me, or perhaps the, the part that I get hung up on is um, you, you know, if I'm just hanging out with a friend and we're, you know, we're talking or we're just having a drink or whatever it is, and, and I'm, you know, and I'm internally kind of not necessarily getting to that conversation of faith, am I pre-evangelization stage or am I just chickening out <laughs> in, in, in having the conversation that perhaps might move the thresholds, uh, move someone through thresholds? Yeah. It's okay. Here's the deal. You don't always know. Right. You, uh, you test the waters. I mean, you're praying, we're presuming you're praying seriously for them and you're praying, you're sort of saying, Lord, I'm available. If this is the time, you know, give me a clue, bring up, you know, help me understand where, what might be, but you, sometimes it's really obvious. Sometimes you say, okay, this is the moment. Okay. Other times you're going, Hmm, I'm not certain. Um, I would throw something out there and let, in other words, let them remember the goal is they have to feel in control and not judge. So you let them either respond to it or change the subject. If they, you know, Sometimes people just do that, they, and that's your clue. Okay, maybe this isn't the time. Um, I think there's always going to be a certain element of uncertainty um, in some sense. You, know, you don't know for sure. But that's why if you've got a good relationship with the Bridge of Trust is there, if they know you honor them, you care about them, if you have a history of listening to them well, they're not going to come unglued. You know, they're going to say... All right, maybe I'm not comfortable with that, but but I know I know Amber, and she's a good friend, and I know Eric. And- so, is there any surefire way to know when that bridge is firmly in place? When that bridge of trust is firmly in place? If they ask, they come. They come and ask you, because um, because they could come and say, you know, we were talking about that last month, and I've been thinking about it. You sound like God spoke to you. Is that is that really what you meant? I mean, are you serious? Okay, so that's obvious, right? Um, and then there's those amazing promptings. You know, you're like, okay, Lord, I, I'll do my best. Um, and then sometimes you just try it and see. I don't. There's no. Um, it's like your and in your friendships. Are your friendships that tight and that tidy that you always know for sure? You know, when your friend's going through a bad time or you're, you're approaching a difficult topic and you're at, are you always sure what the next step is? No, this is, this is like that. Um, but the main thing is if they really trust you, if you've earned the trust, you won't shatter the relationship. Sure. A couple of times now you've, you've mentioned the importance and kind of, of interceding for that person, of praying for them, as well as being like sensitive and aware to those those moments when you get that green light or you get that prompting. How would you how would you kind of go about explaining a good system or a good way to go about interceding for someone or even being aware of those internal promptings? How can we know that that's the Holy um, Spirit? <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh- really interesting because it involves it's a two-way listening you're listening to the holy spirit and you're listening to the other person simultaneously and uh in in terms of intercessory prayer which is hugely important both for individuals but also for christian communities if we're talking about large scale spiritual openness really wanting to see a a drop in defensiveness and a rise in trust on a like a neighborhood basis, a parish basis, that sort of thing, or a diocesan basis, so that there's a lot more of these doors open. Intercessory prayer is hugely important. Um, most Catholics don't know how to do it on any kind of sustained, if you will, organized basis, the intercessory prayer for um, an area or a neighborhood or a parish. Um, so we actually... Yeah, we, we have we train people to do this because most Catholics don't know what I'm talking about. Um, 
There is, however, a wonderful resource <coughs> called um, Christ. Oh, why can't I think of it off the top of my head? Anyway, there's a guide. There's a guide that's published every year. Christ in the City, I think it's, no. It's eluding me now. Um, that comes out every, comes out every Lent. It's 40 days of organized intercessory prayer for your city, for your town, for your neighborhood. That's, you pray scripture over mm. the area and you, it, you can walk the streets and pray for every family and all this stuff, all the needs that you know in the community. Um, and they publish it every year, but there's something called prayer walking where you literally walk the streets and pray for God's provision and uh, healing and movement in all the people who live there. So, the, and, and people do this systematically. They see the spiritual environment change and, and basically tensions drop and openness goes way up and that sort of thing. For individuals, it's the same thing. I would be, I would be praying for, I know God is already speaking to their heart. You'll never meet a person to whom God is not present already in some way whether they know it or not, okay? He is already there. So you are, so you're never uh, going to a place where he is not already at work. Um, and so you say, Lord, um, you know, hey, show me what you are doing. Show me what you have done, what you are doing in their life, where you have lead, you know, leading them. Um, and show me how that, so that I can support, so that I can join, if you will, and be, uh, collaborate or co cooperate with what you are already doing there. Um, you know, Lord, I ask for you to open their heart and mind to you and your presence and your purposes and your goodness and your love. And, you know, and, and then basically show me what I should say now. Um, it's part of this is you have to get used to hearing the Holy Spirit. And yes, is it always super clear? No, it's not always super clear. Sometimes it's clearer than others. Sometimes it's like, oh, that's really obvious. Okay, yes, I know. And other times you're just thinking, hmm, let me try this. Okay. Um, but I, it, it is, it is sort of a skill set you have to develop. How to simultaneously listen to God and to the other person and um, know and, and have a sense of that was important. That story they just said, that was important. Oh, that helps me understand why they feel this way about God or why they've told me you know, other things they've told me in their life. Okay, now I know. Um, so Lord, what, you know, what should I say here or how should I respond? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that yeah. intentional discipleship now isn't just a definition of making the decision to drop one's nets and to follow Jesus. It's also the, the way in which we continue to grow in discipleship and the way in which we continue as missionary disciples to be so intentional with everything that we do. So uh, the intentionality of learning the skill of listening to another, the intentionality of uh, of listening, of learning the skill of listening to the Holy Spirit, and then, you know, doing the double the double duty of listening to the Holy Spirit and listening to someone simultaneously is is a is a skill to be learned. And I know there's been a, a number of times I've been in a conversation where I'm asking at the same time, is there something you want me to say? Is there something that you're you're moving in this in this moment? And uh, Sherry, one of the things that's helped me in this is is almost testing. Um, you know, what I think is a prompting and, and a good question for me has been, is what I'm being prompted to say or do true, beautiful or good mm -hmm. for the other? And, mm -hmm. and if it is, then just do it. So it's, if it's a compliment, make the compliment. If it's, you know, if it's a kind gesture, if it's an invitation, if it's whatever it is, and I can see that it's true good and beautiful for the other, uh, do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, and then, and allow for the results, um, leave the results up to God. That's, that's yeah. the ultimate thing that we, we move away from the expectation that if we do something we, and, and, the, uh, and it has to be done a certain way, the results indicate whether or not we were doing what God wanted us to do. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's not, that's not how it works. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a, I think that's a great way to go about it. And, um, it makes perfect sense. I didn't think of it in quite those terms, but essentially that's what I'm asking. I'm saying, 
I know, <laughs> I know you are at work. I know you want yes. this person to ask what, how can I help? How can I serve what you are already doing and your purposes here? Um, and, and yes, and we'll never, however, it will never be absolutely clear and clear to clear and dry. That's why the trust is so important in the rest of the relationship. So that if you accidentally hit a trigger, there's a context for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really important. The other thing I should mention, you know, the church teaches and has throughout her 2000 year century, uh, centuries, 2000 year history, that all the baptized are given charisms or special ways that were empowered by God, special gifts were given for the sake of others. They're crucial in evangelization and they also color how you and I will be especially effective. Um, where we are able to talk um, with particular authenticity mm -hmm. and power and where people will experience, they will recognize the presence of God in your life. A lot of times it will be around the areas of your charisms. Mm -hmm. And that's, that rouses curiosity. And certain charisms are particularly helpful for people at certain parts of the journey. Mm -hmm. So some of them are like really useful in pre-evangelization, like encouragement or hospitality or something like that. And others, uh, and some people have charisms of evangelism. So literally in their presence, people will just start talking, wanting to talk about God. They will start raising questions about Jesus because in your presence, if you have the charism, it's just irresistible. They don't even know why. You don't have to maneuver them. It just tends to come up. That's in the presence of the cares and people ask you for it even they don't even know why exactly but the holy spirit prompts them to mm -hmm. ask for what you've been given to give yeah. so yeah so there is that some of those factors too that mean i may be especially effective for certain people i mean god may call me to primarily focus on people in certain situations or with certain needs or at certain levels of development, I will be especially effective. And it's not because, um, and all the charisms serve evangelization in some form. So, you know, we may, we're not all got the charism of evangelism. I don't have it, for instance. Um, I'm sorry to say, I wasn't <laughs> talking about that one. Um, but, but that doesn't mean, you know, that I can't play a really significant role. Um, Mm -hmm. in the, the greater mission yeah, yeah yeah we've had some time to talk about pre-evangelization we spent a lot of time in the trust curiosity mm -hmm. open stage and and i'm glad we spent so much time there because trust is so foundational in all of that but let's move to the uh like the the next thresholds so we're now presuming that uh an individual has moved and and taken these small yeses to come to a place of of seeking <laughs> and of you know about to you know to and make that decision crucial. to follow crucial, yeah crucial yeah so let's so you know i'm curious to know you know invitation what kinds of invitations would we make what kinds of journeying are we doing uh the questions that we're asking um and uh, you know and, and and how important is is the choice for someone to make it is you know? and it, i have to tell you one of the things catholics really suck at Give people a clear and safe mm -hmm. opportunity to say a personal yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so the necessity, and this is true in parish life, this is true outside of it. We keep hoping it will just magically happen. Um, but but there's, a, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, uh, like, I mean, this is a classic story, but... Um, one of my one of my genius evangelizing genius friends um, was basically had um, he was doing a vocation Bible school. Do you do vacation Bible schools? Okay, for five and six year olds, mm -hmm. and he said, "Okay, how do I help?" He he said, "I had a curriculum; it was great, but I knew the larger question was, how do I help them? Even at five or six, children can make meaningful decisions um, and say a meaningful yes." not an adult yes but it's meaningful and so he said how do i help kids how do i help a five-year-old become curious how do i help them drop their nets you know and he said in the end we ended we, we gave them 10 minutes of adoration and a little procession and he, he said all weekend week long the kids kept coming up and going i love jesus jesus is living in my heart mm -hmm. 
And they got so excited, they came home and shared it with their parents, and the parents got alarmed and called the pastor. <laughs> called the pastor and texted the pastor and, and said, what have you done to my child? And he had to send out a letter to everyone saying, yes, it is normal for your children to come out of vacation Bible school loving Jesus. <laughs> um, so uh, people in some, some settings, people have created gestures you know you don't have to use words you can uh, one teen retreat they had 24 7 adoration they gave everybody fishing nets and they told the story of jesus meeting the disciples on the sea of galilee and said come follow me and they said they left their fishing nets and they followed him so everybody got you know little fishing nets and they they had a 15 year old boy on his knees in the middle of the night in the chapel with his fishing net in his hand and the adult who was overseeing it, she said, you know, he was, he was on his knees and he kept scooting closer and closer to Jesus Eucharist. And she said, finally, he just threw his net on the ground and they gave him a gesture that gave him away, but it was safe and he could do it on his own speed. So we can ask a friend, we could say, um, you know, We've been talking. We've been talking about this. I mean, you're, this is presuming you've been with them for mm-hmm. a while. That's right. We've had these conversations, and they've been wrestling with Jesus and who He is, and what it means. Say, are you? Is it time? Are you? You know, or not? And if they say, "I'm not ready," that's fine. It's not the end of the world. It's not a no. Remember, this is a journey, and we're all in spiritual motion all the time. So the fact that people they move, they can move forward, and then they often sometimes come to a stop. They get stuck, or they just they can't move any further for a while. That doesn't that's not forever. Find out what the obstacles are that remain that are crucial. Um, they don't have to, for instance, if they're in RCIA, they don't have to have decided whether they're going to enter the church before they can make a decision to follow Jesus. Um, because we believe that they want to follow Jesus, they'll want to be in the church, you know, et cetera. Um, so you can say, and then find out what are, if they're not ready, even though you, it, it felt like they were moving, what are the obstacles? Um, you know, and the crucial ones that really get in the way. Um, you can lead somebody, you could be together with a friend in front of the Blessed Sacrament. You could be doing it, just praying privately. I mean, you could be out on a walk. I mean, mm-hmm. it could happen in a restaurant. It could happen at home. It could happen in a number of places. Yeah, um, it sounds like there's there's the the invitation that's being made. Uh, there is the clear sort of uh, communication that for the individual, you can make a choice, and that choice can it's it's totally up to you. And so, if you want to make the choice to say yes, I will follow mm-hmm. you, Jesus, then. You can do that, but if you don't, it's okay too. That's you know, and, and your, friendship is not at stake. Exactly. I'm not. Yeah, this was not coercion. Yeah, it's yeah. really important. Mm-hmm. They know whatever, wherever they are now, and what, however comfortable they are about this, mm-hmm. the relationship is not is 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 it a yes? Definitely, that you're not walking yeah. away. Yeah. Um, uh, but I I think you know there just comes a point where you you do raise it and just see what they say. And yeah. how to respond to them. Now I know, um, and 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 definitely, if they want to, you know, it, it's much preferable to have them pray in their own words, mm-hmm. tell God, you know, to yeah. articulate to God what they're what they're yeah. actually saying yes to. Um, but again, to have somebody even raise that question with them, to have walked with them, mm-hmm. to be there during and both afterwards and continue, you know, cause it's an ongoing journey. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like, and I'd say this is just in, in society in general, we're used to having physical signs that also mark moments for us. So you've mentioned the, the fishing net or someone lighting a candle or, you know, let's let, you know, let's move to a place where we can sit and pray or let's go to an adoration chapel and sit with Jesus. Like those are, those are important parts to the invitation. If, if someone expresses that they want to make the decision, then we want to make it meaningful, meaningful for them. Uh, and it also expresses for us and for them how important it is and, and how, how much this is in fact a life changing decision. Yeah. And we're celebrating it. We understand yeah. this. We're enthusiastic and understand the significance of it. 
And then the course, of course, there's the next step questions inevitably after mm-hmm. that. Um, but, but that, that, that is the, one of the single biggest issues we deal with, with Catholic leaders at all levels is the having no, we even had to start using the language of dropping nets because people didn't even have a category for it. Mm. We had to use, we found, we invent, we just took a simple biblical passage and said, this is what they did on the Sea of Galilee. They, they got up and left and left their nets and walked. That's what we mean. Because so many Catholics had no concept, no language, no categories for an intentional decision. Yeah. 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 And as someone who's walking with, uh, with another who has made that decision, I, you, you said it celebrating and, and marking that moment is, is a big deal. And we, and it's scriptural, like, you know, we're going to, we're going to put on a party. We're going to celebrate. We're going to, you know, slaughter the fattened cow. Epic and make yeah. it memorable, I think is yeah. the other part of it too. You know, so often we want, we want them to be able to look back at that moment as a definitive life-changing moment that's that's always going to be remembered that they'll look back at and be able to say like something changed and my life has never been the same mm-hmm. and that of course hopefully at this point if they've gotten that far they're not just with you they're part they, they have a wider network of right. relationships mm-hmm. with other christians who can be part of the celebration mm-hmm. yes yeah yeah so that's that's sort of the presumption, and I know, um, yeah. So, I don't know. other. Okay, very good. Well, we've kind of come up to our our time. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question, Sherry. We've we've shared a little bit of what uh, Proclaim is about, and you know how we're encouraging and inviting missionary disciples. Uh, in Vancouver to proclaim Jesus with others. And um, it is, you know, in hearing that and having our conversation, is there anything in particular that you'd love to, um, you know, to, to share with our listeners? Oh, about um, proclaim as such. I, I think it's very, very, very exciting. I mean, it's a, okay, it's a first step. Absolutely. Okay. So it's, in, and in many ways, one of the things is just to understand that uh, going out and building those relationships with this kind of awareness and skill set is so crucial. And then being the person who can be sort of the living bridge to help them maybe get engaged with an alpha course or a CCO small group. Um, but understanding that is still most people who go through a single experience like that don't come out disciples. They're starting too far back, but they will move one or two thresholds. Mm -hmm. And so the threat, understanding just the journey, we want to honor that journey. We want to honor what God has done in their lives. We want to honor every single yes they make and rejoice in it and make, and so that they see it as significant and know it is significant and still say there's more Mm. and it's it's even better. And uh, And so that, to have a a whole emerging sort of cohort or army or whatever you want to call it of, you know, of uh, intentional disciple becoming missionary disciples, you know, wandering the streets and the, and the families and the the city of Vancouver is very exciting. Um, But honestly, the two things, the most important things are intercessory prayer breaking the silence about mm-hmm. possibility of relationship with God, about Jesus, about what he's done, about his call to follow. And those two things is, I think, as, as lay apostles, if you will, lay missionary disciples, um, are the things that in, in this culture we are key. Because um, so many of those people, they won't be able to make the journey unless a friend helps them make it. Amen. Well, Sherry, we're so grateful that you've spent some time with us to uh, to have a discussion around journeying with with individuals, encouraging intentional disciples, talking through our thresholds. And uh, for our listeners, if you want to know more, you can get Sherry's book, Forming Intentional Disciples. Uh, continue to pray for, for Sherry and her work, and we'll ask you to pray for us. So thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you for letting me. 
giving me this opportunity. And God bless all that you are doing in Vancouver. It's very exciting.